Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. The fall chill has taken over the campuses of Bristol Community College, and that means we are entering the second half of the fall 2009 semester. In these tight financial times, everyone is looking at ways to save a buck, and BCC is no different. But the college often looks at any potential savings in ways that can also make an impact on the environment. One such move is an effort to help control the amount of printing being done across campus. All organizations see their fair share of waste, and many times paper is the biggest culprit. Network Administrator James Armstrong says for years students have taken printing privileges for granted, and that has led to abuse. We had a lot of waste. I mean, there was tons of paper being thrown away, people printing, you know, mass amounts of, you know, things that were unnecessary. They were printing, you know, they would go and print PowerPoint presentations, you know, using full screen mode, black text. I mean, and it was 200 pages long, and then they'd see the amount of pages that it took up, and they were like, I don't want this. This, you know, it's just, you know, and so th what the program has done is it's made people a little more conscientious. Other problems we had is, you know, people not picking print jobs up. That was another big thing that happened. People were taking and they go print something out, they'd forget about it, and next thing you know, at the end of the day, we have 100 pages of things that people have printed that just nobody picked up. That waste led to the college examining how other educational institutions handle their student print allocations. The result is what's called the Green Print Program, which puts a sheet number and monetary value limit for each student enrolled at the college. Armstrong says the college tested the plan before putting it into place. We ran a pilot last March and K both K-130 and the library in A building both were put on the system and they have both reported that there's been a significant decrease in the amount of paper consumption, a lot of which is people that print stuff, print jobs and don't go and pick them up because in those locations, students need to release the jobs before they're printed. So when they go and print the job, it isn't printed out on the printer and it sits there until somebody picks it up. Only if the student really wants what they printed, you know, will they take and um, actually go and release the job. That's in those two locations. Armstrong says the goal is not to penalize the students. The goal of the program is not was not to is not, is not to take and charge students for printing, and that's some some people have that misconception. That's not why the college implemented the program. The college implemented the program to take and make people more aware of what they're printing, because a lot of people have no idea. They go to a website, print something. Next thing they know, they have 30 pages. The system notifies the person every time they print a job, how much they're printing, and what it's going to cost. So it makes the person, the goal of the program is to make the person more aware and to help save on the environment, take and, take and help save on resources and use less paper. Here's how the program works. Each full-time student is allocated $20 worth of printing, which translates into 200 black and white printed pages. Part-time or non-credit students can print up to 100 black and white pages for a value of $10. When they go and print a job, they are given, a, you know, basically they are, a message pops up on the screen that tells them you're printing 20 pages, this is what it's going to cost you. Every semester that money is given to the student at the beginning of the semester. As long as they stay registered as a full-time student, they'll keep the $20 for the remainder of the semester. And they can use this, you know, they use that for their classwork or other items that they want to print. Um, at the end of the semester, that money, that balance is reset and they're given an interim balance for between semesters for printing out schedules, transcripts, and things like that. And then if they register for the following semester, they are taken and given an additional print allotment for the semester. So every semester, at the beginning of the semester, they're given a print allotment. Armstrong says the program also allows for students to use less paper, or in some cases, none at all. One of the things with the program that, you know, is good is it gives the person the ability to control what they print. We've installed alternative options for students on most lab computers, where the goal is for all but most lab computers. Students have the option to print um, their documents out as PDFs.
so they don't actually have to utilize paper. It's a greener, it's a more, it's a greener option. And if they have a device where they can take in a computer at home, they don't have internet access, they can put the documents on a thumb drive or another medium, take the document home, and view it on a home computer or a smartphone or other devices. So most of the labs have the ability for students to print directly to a PDF file, which means they don't use any of their print funds, which costs them nothing. So far, the new green print program has been well received by students with very little roadblocks in its implementation. Armstrong believes that the print allocations should be more than enough to meet all students' needs. But if a student does exceed his or her allocation, more print jobs can be purchased through funds added to the student's Access BCC card at account management centers located at the Fall River, Attleboro, and New Bedford campuses. We'll have more around BCC right after this. Welcome back. Bristol Community College has for years outreached to many sectors of the international community and this year they've instituted a brand new program and they're part of what's called the Community Colleges for International Development or CCID and there are a number of international students here at BCC for the first time and we're going to talk a little bit about the program now and talk to some of those students as well as it's an exciting time not only for Bristol Community College, but hopefully for these students as well. Let me introduce who I have uh, with us today. First, I have Peter Schuyler. He's the, he's the Dean of Math, Science, and Engineering. He's also the coordinator of the CCID program. Thank Hi. you for joining me. We have uh, Tuba Nzuza, yeah. who is one of the international students, and also Touch Mal Maluleke. Maluleke. And I did it right, right? Yes. A uh, couple, two students who are both from South Africa? Yes. Here at BCC, uh, that'll They'll both be here for the entire year, correct? Yep. Peter, let me start with you. Um, talk a little bit about what the Community College for International Development program is and how did BCC get involved? Okay. It's a program that's sponsored by the Department of State uh, to be able to bring students from other countries and allow them to experience uh, essentially the community college experience the same as our students do. Um, so it allows students who come from various different international backgrounds uh, who may or may not have a similar community college type structure in their countries to be able to come study in the United States, learn about the United States, how its government works, how um, society in America is, as well as gaining uh, an educational degree over the year that they're here. Were, were there, are there any set of criteria that BCC had to meet in order to be involved with this <coughs> program and, and what, what are they? Um, we needed to be able to support the students um, primarily, which was there was a variety of different programs that they were focused on. Uh, there was different host countries, Egypt, and then a variety of other international groups. So the idea is that BCC had to be able to provide programs that students could complete in a year uh, to be able to return to their country. And then the majority of them appear to want to go on to get continued education in their country. Now, does the State Department work on, on securing the students and getting them here in terms of uh, qualifying which students will come to, to, as part of this yeah. program? CCID is part of a Fulbright grant as well, and they take care of in each of the host countries. There's an interviewing process and an application process where all the students are pre-screened. They have to meet certain academic requirements as well as uh, background requirements. And then the students are brought here. They, uh, all of our students, for the large part, uh, can, were at a pre-academic uh, at Northampton College in Pennsylvania. Um, so they spent seven weeks there, and then they came uh, to BCC, and they've been here since early August. Now, um, how many students are, are, are here? We have two of them here today, but how many in the entire program? We have seven this year. Okay. And uh, these two gentlemen are from South Africa. You mentioned Egypt. What are some of the uh, other countries? Guyana and Brazil. Okay. Now those are part of this specific program. Um, yes. That now, how many other community colleges are involved? Do you happen to know? 
Um, I think there's something like 30 to 40 different community colleges that are participating in the program. Um, about half the students come from Egypt and the other half come from these countries, Indonesia and a few other countries, and they're right. expanding the program. Now, how, um, how much of a challenge was it to find um, host families for these students and also to, to, to get them, because that's part of the BCC's commitment, I believe, is to find families that will, that will host the students and also uh, you know, just provide them with, with their daily needs. Right. Well, the host families are actually mentor families. Okay. Uh, the students live in an apartment complex, okay. um, each with a roommate. And the, what the mentor families, the, we reached out to the BCC community, so all the, and we really had no problem finding mentor families. The, the community was very open to it. Um, all of the mentor families are associated with BCC. They're adjunct faculty, some were staff people, some were f other faculty members, full-time faculty members. So there's a, a whole host of different people uh, that applied to be host families. To, and uh, what they do is, at least once a week, we ask them to get together with mm -hmm. them to try to experience uh, what American society is like. So mm -hmm. they invite the student into their house and to participate in a variety of different activities with their family. Right, let's talk with the students too, but let me start with you. Um, how did you get involved with the program? And I guess what, what has your experience been early on, first here in the United States, and secondly with the, the BCC and your courses here? Um. Where should I start? Like the part where like, how did I f like found out about? Yes, the, how did the, you find out about the program? Uh, the program, I didn't know anything about it, uh, but I, I happened to work in my university where I was studying in like back in South Africa. Um, like somebody, like my boss, uh, she knew someone who was involved in this program. So in that way, she applied for me, and I, I had to go there for an interview. And because I, I had good grades, and and that's how I got the scholarship. And um, since I've been here, uh, I've experienced like, like quite a lot of things. You know, like United States is a diverse country. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, things that I didn't know before. And the nicest thing is here at BCC is that uh, everything is available to students. You just have to take advantage of it. And that's it. Like the most like wonderful thing is that you can see the president every day, every time. It's not like where I'm from, where the presidents and the deans, they are so special such that it, it's not easy even like to talk to them like around. So it's like here, it's, there's a lot of communi like uh, communication and in involvement, which is good for students. Let's say maybe uh, I happen to see the president, then I, 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 I can tell me like everything that I want to tell him mm -hmm. anytime. It's not like I have to make an appointment like a month before I see him. Yeah, although that he, if you want to go to, to his office, then you, you have to make an appointment. I know that. But then I think th that's a good thing. And even the instructors, too, they are very good. Right. They know their work and they are willing to help everybody. I think the education system is, is good. Yeah. Tell me about some of the courses you're taking. What are some of the courses you're taking this semester? Uh, I'm taking five courses, which is... Um, it's that's, pretty, that's pretty full load there. Yeah, yeah, it's five. Yeah, uh, it's ETK forty one, which is fundamentals of mach of machining. ETK seventy nine, which which is material science. Uh, ETK sixty four, which is hydraulics and pneumatics. Um, then there's uh, history sixty, yeah, which is U.S. government and and history. Yeah, mm. and I think that's all five, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah, those are so good and. The nicest thing is um, the instructors, they are so good. Like, I don't know, they just like kept my, they just uh, like uh, took me by surprise. The way that they do their things, the way that they present their work is so perfect. That even if you don't really understand, I mean, like the most challenging thing like for me was that uh, I had to adapt to the US system, like the US standards and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, because like, I, I think all, like, all around the world, we are using like the metric system right. instead of, yeah. So like the U.S. has like inches, you know, like feet and everything. It's all different. Yeah, so it's different. But yeah, I'm adapting and I'm coping with it. So far, so good. So far, so well. good, yeah. Touch, how about you? Um, how did you get involved with the program? And, and tell a little bit about how 
you've been able to adapt here in America and here at BCC? Okay, for me, they just brought the advertisement in the college, mm -hmm. and then I had to apply to the U.S. Embassy in order to be participating in this program. And then they selected me, and then I went through the interviews, and then I passed all of them until I got here. The most important thing, like the difficult part where I had the problem was with the food. Yeah, <laughs> because in where we were before in Pennsylvania, we had no time to cook for ourselves. Right. We had to go and eat in a cafeteria. So food which they had, the, it was somehow, I had some difficulties on adapting to it. But now here, I have to cook for myself. We just cook for ourselves. I had to learn to learn Brazilian food, something mm -hmm. like that, yeah. So I'm adapting to it. And the college itself, it was amazing on the first day when I got there because when we got here on our first day, like we were welcomed by the president of the college. Mm -hmm. It was something to me because as he was saying that in South Africa, most of the colleges and universities, it's even difficult to see a president even once a year. Mm. Yeah. Some they're just attending, they don't even know who the president of the college is. So, but here, everywhere you go, you just walk around with him. I think that's a characteristic of, of, of community colleges in general, and especially here in Massachusetts, because all the colleges are of a certain size. Bristol is actually one of the larger ones. We have a, a, pretty, a pretty large uh, um, you know, enrollment. So um, that's something that is, is maybe more common here in, in the United States than, than maybe other parts of the country. So, so Touch, what are you taking in terms of some of your classes? Uh, I'm taking six classes. Six classes? Yes. I have three ESL classes. Okay. And construction estimating and AutoCAD architectural designing and history. But my major is applied construction technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so far, everything's going well with you? Yeah, again? everything is going well. But I had difficulties on my first week because I had they had to introduce me in the, the because I'm used to metric. Same yeah. thing as what, yeah. what Tuba said. The metric system is the metric getting, system. So now I have to get used to inches and feet, something like that. So, but now I'm used to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask both of you, and either one of you can answer. Um, what are you looking forward to? I mean, we're taping this in October. Um, we're about halfway through this first semester. What are you looking forward to, not only here at Bristol Community College, but what are you also hoping to experience while you're here in the United States? I mean, uh, the social conduct, I mean, like the etiquettes, the way that Americans present themselves. I mean, everybody's talking about the American dream, the American dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly, like, what is it? I, I wanted to know exactly what is it. There is the American dream. So uh, school-wise, yeah, like education, the way that the, the education system it is, and outside, how do people like live their own life away from, uh, let's say, mm, from, uh, like from their work or like from school or from wherever like, that keeps them in the offices. But then uh, like when you go out, the way Americans uh, eat food, I mean, like, the way that uh, they, I should say, the way that they treat themselves and how do they get to reach that American dream. I mean, like, what I've noticed is, like, most people can just make uh, a lot of money on a lousy job. I think that's the reason why most of the companies uh, lost that working force thing, because it, it, it was like, there's a lot of money that Americans can do with such just little things mm -hmm. and you find that people here most people they go for like what they want they they don't want to like um sacrifice their happiness and comfort and comfortness unlike in other countries where you work because you are challenged you work because you want to do this and that and then like you don't like what you're doing but then we're just there there's nothing else yeah, yeah and then th th there's nothing else like, to do but then here it's like there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of exposure, I mean, yeah. yeah. Peter, let me ask you as we, uh, as we wrap up, um, 
this is, um, I, I believe, the first year the college yep. is involved. Are there, you know, possibilities of continuing? Is, is this just a one-year deal, and how, how does that work? Right now, it's a one-year deal. Um, we have to reapply every year, and, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to continue the program in the future. But I, I think one of our um, missions at the college is to increase our international exposure and bring more students on through programs like CCID and other grant programs. So. We're looking to expand the entire international student population and, and great, get a greater exposure through programs like CCID. Well, I want to thank the three of you for joining us today. Maybe we'll have you back in the spring and see how you made out as, uh, as you finish your year here at Bristol Community College. All the best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Time now for our next edition of our look at famous alumni here at BCC with alumni in your community. My name is Michaela Gagney, and I'm a graduate of BCC, class of 2008. I'm from Fall River, Mass, and I've grown up here, lived here my whole life. And I grew up uh, extremely interested in art and in sports. So I went through high school, really dedicated to my art classes, and a three-season athlete in high school. And I always wanted to, actually for a long time, I wanted to be a Disney artist. <laughs> that was a big piece. And then I recognized I wanted to work with kids, and I wasn't exactly sure how. I had all these interests. And it was uh, later in college that I put it all together. I wanted to be an art therapist. My senior year of high school, here I was, I wanted to go Division One soccer, and I actually got diagnosed with a life-threatening heart condition. And it's one of these conditions you hear about athletes dropping dead from suddenly, unknown, underlying. So I was lucky, I was lucky they found it, but of of course, I was, I was shattered because my dreams were taken away from me. I couldn't play sports again. Um, so I actually had uh, a surgery to have a defibrillator put in uh, that keeps me safe now. But in the meantime, I took up pageants as sort of a, I don't know, a way to fill the void, I guess, left by sports. It started as a joke. My guidance counselor said, why don't you run for Miss Fallover? And I said, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I hadn't even brushed my hair that day. <laughs> and I was <laughs> not what you would call a beauty queen. But I took it as a dare, and I entered my first pageant and I walked like a jock. <laughs> I was <laughs> there was no grace, no poise. But actually I really loved it because I was given time to speak to the judges or about my platform issue, which was lethal heart conditions like my own, and how I was gonna do something about it. So pageant got in my blood and I ended up uh, sticking with it and I kept competing. In 2006, I became Miss Massachusetts and started becoming a national spokesperson for the American Heart Association, Parent Heart Watch, and several other cardiac organizations. I pursued my education at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where I was an art major and a psychology minor. A wonderful time, I had a great time. I, was, uh, I concentrated in graphic design, digital imaging, and photography. And at that time, I learned about art therapy, which was a great way to combine my interests of working with people, helping people, and art. So I went to get my master's degree at Lesley University, and I uh, graduated from there in 2006 with a mental health counseling and art therapy degree. Art therapy is a really fascinating field because it basically goes on the concept that when you're in the counseling uh, realm with a person, sometimes they can't communicate verbally to you. Sometimes they don't want to communicate verbally. And there's all these studies done, uh, for instance, with trauma and how our brain actually stores it photogra photographically so that when we say that there's no words for it, there truly are no words. But art can be that bridge between helping a person release between helping a counselor understand their patient and um, it, it's just a really holistic great way to be able to work with someone. Art therapy is used across the populations. Um, it's commonly thought to be used with only children, but it, that could be furthest from the truth. It's really effective across the realm of ages and um, different diagnoses. And it can be used, you know, any counselor or therapist could have a background in art therapy because you're also given a solid background in the counseling, um, in the clinical aspect of everything. You just use art as one of your tools to work with your client. One of my prizes for becoming Miss Massachusetts was that I received a one year, uh, one year of free tuition to Bristol Community College, which was really exciting. I mean, at this point I had my master's degree, but I love to learn, and I'd heard wonderful things about BCC, so I was really excited at what I could jump into. Uh, in addition, my aunt teaches there, and she's always spoken wonders about it. So I kind of, my the first semester I was there, I, I took three different classes, tried out a few different things, and one of them happened to be one of the thanatology classes and you know probably a couple of classes and I got hooked and I said well I'm, I'm gonna do this certificate no matter what and I ended up finishing and uh, and finishing up the uh, certificate. 
I really loved my professors at BCC. I thought they were, it was nice to be in an environment where it was small, I got a lot of attention, um, and I'll, it was a lot of hands-on stuff. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed my classmates. We had a great time in the, in the night school, and um, overall, it was just, it felt like home. I work at St. Vincent's Home in Fall River, and it's a residential and educational facility for children in need. Most of our kids have uh, a multitude of behavioral, cognitive, and emotional issues, as well as different educational issues. So I have the fun job, I'm the art teacher, and um, it's a great experience, and it's really useful to have an art therapy background to make art on a more meaningful level with these kids. I started six years ago and at first I was in direct care with the kids so I think I understood, uh, was able to understand them a lot so when I moved into the role of teacher it really helped with uh, being able to incorporate ideas that I thought uh, were just really meaningful. I'm not, I don't cut and paste and glue with the kids, it's, it's much deeper um, whether it be a mosaic which really um, the project behind me is actually they picked a positive word and then they use the mosaic tiles to illustrate it. Uh, so it was a really fun project but it's just uh, being aware of what the kids limits are um, and giving them the freedom to just create rather than give them a, a grade for how good their art was. I, I don't believe in grades for skill, I believe in grades for participation and effort. When I, when I see a kid really engage in art and get it and understand it and dive into it, there is no greater feeling. There really isn't. And sometimes that might not be with painting or drawing, but sometimes that might be when we're in the graphic design room and playing around with different computer images. And there, I mean, there's no greater feeling because then you feel like you gave a kid this gift, this outlet where they can escape from a lot of the problems they have in their life and just be a kid and just have fun and just express themselves. Here are some other news and notes from around BCC. The college celebrated Hispanic Latino Heritage Month throughout October. The celebration included the screening of Hispanic films, music, and also included panel discussions on the role Hispanics play throughout the South Coast. The Hispanic culture also received special recognition as part of the International Club's annual Map Day celebration, which commemorated the students, faculty and staff who hail from the over 50 countries represented across all BCC campuses. The second season of intercollegiate soccer is over and it proved to be a disappointing one for the Bees. The men's squad finished with a record of 3-12 while the women finished up at 2-7. But not to fear sports fans, the men's and women's basketball squads are currently on the court for their second season and we'll have updates coming up next month. BCC has announced two new articulation agreements with other local universities. Criminal justice graduates can now have all of their credits transferred to the baccalaureate program at Salve Regina University in Newport, while management students can now take bachelor and master's degree courses right here at the Fall River campus through an agreement with Eastern Nazarene College. Congratulations are in order to seven students who have been recently elected to the Student Senate. They are Joseph Frias, Gavin Lopes, Jessica Mendes, Abu Moro, Melissa Pina, Alicia Souza, and Nicholas Staub. This group of senators will be in office through the 2010 spring semester. Even in these tough economic times, there are still some companies that are hiring. The college recently held a fall job fair where students honed their interview skills and applied for many part-time positions available at local companies. That'll do it for this edition of Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next month.